Hello and welcome to the Admin Bar, the community that helps you streamline your processes, sharpen your skills, and demand higher paying projects. My name is Kyle Van Dusen and I am the co-host with Matthew Siebert. I'm from Ogle Web Design just outside of Fort Worth, Texas. Good morning, Matthew Siebert Design. How are you doing today, Matt? I am doing well. I am the other co-host and uh, I'm excited to begin with Pisha here today. Yes, I'm excited too. Yes, we're going to be talking with Pisha Neri from Design for Geeks, and she recently just released a free course called UX for Everyone, which I immediately enrolled in, and I got to say it's absolutely fantastic. So we're going to dive into the world of user experience and take a look at some ways we can improve our designs by putting our visitors' needs at the forefront of our planning. But before we dive in, uh, we do have a quick word from this week's show sponsor. Today's show is sponsored by Termageddon. Termageddon is a privacy policy generator that automatically updates as the laws change so you can keep yourself protected from costly lawsuits. Termageddon partners with agencies by providing them a free set of policies for their own agency website. All that they ask in return is that if you like their service, you recommend it to your clients. But the best part is they'll give you a commission for every one of your referrals. Register at termageddon.com for your free agency account. That's termageddon.com. All right, Pisha, how, hello, and how are you doing today? I am doing extremely well, thank you very much. It's a very sunny day here in Spain. It's the afternoon, unlike uh, where you are. And uh, yeah, very, very lovely day. Thank you very much. Well, awesome. Very well, happy to be here. Very happy to be here again. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're glad to have you back on. Yeah, so uh, for, the, for those of you that missed uh, missed Pisha on the show before, you can go back. I'll look up and put in the show notes which episode that was, but that was a fantastic talk as well. But for those of you that aren't familiar with Pisha, why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you found yourself on the admin bar today? Sure. So where shall we start? Not too far back. It would take too long. Anyway, I am a bit like you, Carol, print designer turned to the web a while ago. Uh, my, um, initially, my experience was in book design because I actually I am an art historian by training. I don't know if it ever came out. Sometimes it comes out, sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, so that's how I got started. And then because I lived in London for many years, I'm Italian, but lived in London for many years. So I then got sort of into the world of branding and, and working with big agencies on big accounts and things like that, but always doing projects with the cultural sector quite a lot. And then I became, I was the uh, creative director for the British Film Institute for a while. And then after that, I worked with film festivals and things like that, um, which was great fun. But then I sort of got sort of mm, irresistibly drawn to the web and uh, of course, starting with WordPress, as many of us print designers did, because it's the first port of call, isn't it? And then when I started designing for the web, I realized that there were so many things that were very, very different from designing for print. It, the design principles, of course, are, are the same, but the way you approach a project, I found to be completely, completely different because the set of issues are entirely different. I was quite thrown. I don't know if it happened, to you and and to Matt as well. Sorry, I should have mentioned you too because you're you have a similar story as well, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. That's why Kyle and I get along so well. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, and I think that that's why we often coincide, you know, as a trio on on what we think about design. But so I'm sure that you found that as well. And actually, it's the conversation partly that we had last time. We began with a similar conversation. How different it is to transfer to the web and that's when the thought of UX when I was especially when I started design for geeks which is basically trying to bridge the gap between designers and developers and marketers and anybody else who designs on the web without being a trained designer the the uh, point of where to start from I was asking myself where should we all start from and that's where the UX thing came up because basically it does all start from UX. There's two things about it. First of all, anything you produce, any website, any app, in fact, I think we should start uh, getting into the habit of calling what we design products 
it's kind of, I think it's a better umbrella these days. And I think a website is a product. So um, whatever you design will give your users an experience. It's inevitable. It exists, ergo, it gives an experience. So it needs to start from there because if you miss that essential bit, then you're essentially shooting in the dark. And another really important point to make, I think, is that we're probably all already doing some form of uh, UX process anyway without knowing that that is what we are doing. So because as as um, I'm sure a few people who are watching maybe will be thinking, UX normally is associated with big uh, big agencies, big projects, big budgets. Little people don't think that they can do UX. So they think, oh yeah, but I don't I don't even know what it is. I've never done UX research. And then when you look into it, you go, actually no, you have done research and you don't know a big team, don't need a big team to do it. So basically the, the free course is my take on it. It's how I took the process as I knew it and I adapted it to us small people. Yeah. And you know, uh, one thing, if, if any of you aren't in Pisha's Facebook group, I'll put links in the show note to that as well. Uh, she's got a fantastic group. And one thing I love that they've been doing recently is kind of like UX fails in real life. So the other day there was one where there was like in a, a picture in a hotel room and the nightstand was like right up against the bed, but the drawer was facing the bed. So you couldn't open the drawer and it was like a complete user experience fail, you know? So I think you're right. And that kind of illustrates the point that we all do deal with user experience all the time. Yeah. Um, I was, um, I was going to say, labeling it. Oh no, go ahead. Uh, well, we're not, we're not labeling it in our mind user experience. You know what I mean? Go ahead, Matt. Right. Yeah. And I was going to say, you know, to follow that up is that, you know, you are studying UX every time you go to somebody else's website, because if you if you ever say to yourself, why did they do this? Or this is complicated or like, you know, it's just frustrating. You're learning from that. And typically when you hit something like that and you're developing a site that's similar, you know, in the future, you're going to you're going to recall that and say, you know what? I've hit this before. I know how people don't like it. I'm going to do something different. And, you know, with Pisha, she's taking that and just making, you know, 10x that. Right. And, you know, I had I had an example come up the other day and, and both of you being from print, you'll you'll like this. And I came from like a sign industry. So here in the neighborhood I live in called Meander Estates, it sounds fancy. It's not. Um, but uh, we have like a community wide garage sale once a year. Right. So the, the homeowners association puts out these signs at every entrance to the neighborhood. Uh, to advertise that we're having our community wide garage sale. So they put these out last week and there's, you know, it's like a typical real estate sign. It's two foot by a foot and a half. And they have a giant Meander Estates logo across 80% of the sign. And then underneath in Times New Roman, really small, it says community garage sale. And I'm just like, what are they doing? You know, this is a total fail. What are people thinking? So, I mean, that's a good example of people not putting their users first. If somebody's driving around looking for a garage sale, they don't want to know the name of the neighborhood. They want to know that there's a garage sale there. So I think that's another illustration of, uh, you know, looking at these things from the user's perspective. So Pisha, how would you define user experience? User experience is what ever some so user experience i think is putting the user at the center of your designs basically is user another way that to define it is user centered design and then when you get to that then you get to the fact when you start thinking about it more closely you're probably even sort of slightly disturbed by the word user because user is like very, very dry and almost not offensive but almost offensive word basically the human beings that are going to interact with whatever you produce that's user experience so that's where it starts from it starts from empathy with whoever is going to use your product and that opens a whole world it really really does because when you start talking about empathy the first thing is that you need to use the right kind of empathy. Uh, before I forget, just in case I forget, there are two essential talks about empathy that are a must watch. They're uh, incredibly 
wonderful to watch anyway that anyone you don't need to be actually a web designer uh, to to watch them one is by uh, morton ran erickson whose uh, his site his website is more10.com he's a fabulous uh uh, I know him because he, he's an instructor. He teaches on lynda.com. He's fantastic. And he did a talk at Work Emp Europe 2016 on empathy. And it's a fantastic talk. And basically what he says is don't, just because you think that you've used empathy, it doesn't mean that you have. Because the first thing about empathy is that you have to accept the fact that it's not possible for you to know how someone else feels. You just can't know. So if you think that, you know, you can imagine how a pregnant woman feels like, no, you can't, not unless you've been pregnant or you wear the pregnancy suit. You Believe just me, my wife's <laughs> reminded me that about a Brazilian time. As she's, as you know, she's probably right. So she's just be, right. obviously, so just be accepting, just accept this and try and put yourself in, in the shoes of your uh, users and actually walk in them a few miles. So for instance, you know, one thing that you can do is, is to make sure because accessibility is another essential factor that gets affected. If you, when you start using empathy, you start thinking, is my website accessible enough? And then suddenly the fancy hover effects matter much less than the fact that someone needs to be able to navigate your site by using the keyboard rather than using a mouse. So these are, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm not sure if all my websites are like that. I'm going over there. You know, it's amazing that the, the, the um, mechanisms that are triggered. And the other essential empathy talk, even more, is Eric A. Meyer, Meyer, I don't know how to pronounce his surname, M-E-Y-E-R, who's, uh, he's, he's fantastic. And it's actually, I think it's on WordPress TV, if I'm not wrong. Uh, although he's not necessarily just a WordPress guy, but he's um, he's responsible for getting Facebook to stop doing uh, willy-nilly the timeline summing up of your year as sort of a celebration. Because I mean, really, it's just goosebumps. It's so harsh because he's basically his um, six-year-old uh, daughter died of cancer, and on Christmas Eve, like. A few weeks after her death, Facebook comes up with this sort of celebration full of photos of his daughter. And it, it looks like it's celebrating the death of this of this little girl. So it's terrible. It's absolutely. Ah, and but it's 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 essential because it made it actually it made Facebook stop doing that. It made Facebook change their practices. And the whole of the talk is about this. It's about how you giving examples of how you can and should exercise empathy and the things that you should consider. It's very hard to do. It's, it's quite uh, difficult to consider everything that you should consider. So it's not, it's not gonna be perfect, but we can definitely start. You, know, it, you can, de can definitely get started with that. And then the other, the thing that I love, love, love about the concept of UX and the way the UX works is that the whole point of UX is that it's not perfect. You don't give your client a product that is perfect coming out of the box. You tell them, and that's really important, you need to make sure that they understand that this is what we think works now. We can only improve it based on, on the data that our human beings that use the website are going to provide us with. And by asking them questions as much as possible, I think this is the biggest lesson. And I think that this is, as especially if for those of us who work with small clients, we need to make them understand because it's a common mentality that you know a client is like you know a website is like a brochure. You know, once you've done it, it's printed. That's it. Right. No, it's not like that. But as we know very well, yeah, it's not and, like that at all. And that's one thing that that is really great. And there's a lot of great things about your course, but that's one thing that's great in there is kind of talking about that that user testing. But you did say something that I had put in my notes before this show to kind of bring up. So you led me into it nicely. Um, you brought up Facebook and user experience, and I and I kind of had this this uh, general idea written down, and I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts at it. So you have, uh, I'm going to use two different really huge sites that everybody knows, right? So you have a site like Google. You go to google.com and you land there and it's pretty much a blank page 
with a search box. And when you type in a search query, exactly the thing that you think is going to happen happens always. And then the information is displayed in a way that makes perfect sense to your brain. Then you have another giant site like facebook.com that you log into and nobody knows really how anything works on it. Like there's just <laughs> random shit in my feed that I don't know. It's not in like a time order. It's not in an importance. It's just completely random and nobody understands it. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that um, the other day. So I don't know when the, the, uh, the update was pushed out, but um, like profiles have changed slightly and I was trying my damnedest to find my own photos like my, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out where the hell they, they put them. Like, apparently now it's down towards the bottom and like a little like square but there's no there's no photos button anymore and even pressing that it's it's pushing it towards or pushing you towards uh your profile pictures and updating that stuff and not seeing like all of your old albums that's 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 awful right so so how do, how do those two things exist in the same world i mean these are two huge companies that i mean both of them have flaws but both of them are doing really well um, but one seems to be handling UX a lot better than the other, wouldn't you say? Uh, yes, even though I don't want to spoil, you know, rain on your parade, but that's about the good, the one good thing, good user experience with Google, because try and go into Google Play or the admin for G Suite, yeah. and, you know, that's a completely different conversation that we would be having. Yes. Also, yeah. my Search Console pet- is the worst. Oh, <laughs> or any of the oh, help yeah, forums yeah, on yeah, Google. Getting into the analytics or the, or the webmaster tools, that's terrible. But try and get a, an invoice for, for certain. There's a certain service that I actually gave up on giving an, an invoice for to my accountant. It's like four euros. euros. I'm like, okay, I'm writing that off because it's impossible to find. It's not worth my time. It's just not worth it. So, there's, they don't do it. That my, my theory about that is that it's it's a mess because they uh, they have had an organic growth, especially Facebook. They I think there was a vision behind it, as we know. There was definitely a vision behind it, and it was the vision was mostly I think that it was going to be created largely by the users, and then the users will be completely what's the polite word to say that you know you don't have to by, by screwed over by facebook in a million different ways so but facebook gets us to create the experience that's what happens but that was always the vision so i think that that's why it's messy it's because there was a vision where the users would completely create the experience but that doesn't mean that it was a planned UX because how do you plan Facebook? How do you, I mean, also, because the people that experience Facebook, I mean, there's billions and billions of people in, in it. It's not possible, I think, to uh, ask samples of, because what kind of samples of population do you predict? I, I'm probably completely different in my habits from anybody else my age in my same building. Do you know what I mean? So right. I think that it's it's uh it's sort of too much but i do wonder sometimes i just think seriously did you seriously do this i do not understand but at the same time somehow we all put up with it which is incredible until we won't because there's right. no you know i know that feel now they feel like a giant that will never go away but it's not not necessarily you know they may one day just do the one thing that completely topples them over you know just, just say two words my space you know right or others, you know, or uh, or uh, AOL, you know, all the things that were like, or Yahoo, even things that were complete giants, and then they went wrong somehow, and and they and just they weren't anymore. Like, the, for instance, they completely ruined Instagram for me. Since since uh, there is an algorithm, the whole point of Instagram is gone for me. For me, it was the chronology. I had things, you know, it was mm-hmm. easy. There was, and I miss and those then, days. yeah. But that's, it's, it's always because they want to make as much money as possible. So they're not really thinking. The whole point is that, in fact, actually, I've got it now. They're not thinking about the users. They're not. They're just thinking about how to make much money, as much money as possible through the users. So that it's not thinking about the, the good of the users. Yeah. And, and they might be actually yeah, thinking of the users not as you and I scrolling through Facebook, but the users being 
the advertisers and how can we get exactly. their posts in front of the most people as possible so we can collect more of their dollars. So I guess it depends too on who you're focusing on, who your user is. Um, so in your, in your course, you talk about um, the, the process of UX and design thinking and you go through three phases um, yeah. within that. So why don't you kind of give us a brief outline of what those phases are? And I'd like to move from there into talking about how we can kind of fit this into our development process, because I think thinking about all this is going to be a little bit new for us. And we want to know where we should start with this. Yes. So the first thing, so design thinking is, um, is a methodology that's like I say, I sort of, that's my condensation into a, an abbrevi abbreviated UX process because the UX process with big teams and so on is huge and there's lots of different professional figures within it and so on. So this is my distillation. It's just, just to make clear that, you know, I'm not claiming that I'm a, you know, sort of big UX guru because that's not who I am. But the design thinking process I, I like very much because it starts from empathy. It's got its negative sides, but... I think that if you stick to the research phase as being the most important, that's where it's 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 it becomes it brings real change for for small people like us. So the research is is where it all starts. And I think that the big thing to understand is that the research is on the clients and on the clients' users. We have you always have two types of users, not just one. And you all do it already. We all do it. I mean, anyone who's done WP Elevation, they talk about a technique that's called go wide, go deep. And basically, it's asking questions in depth to your client. And that's a form of, of UX because you're researching. Then the important distinction to make is that you also need to ask your client about the, their users, which is what I don't think gets done enough. And I think that's a big shift to make and the mentality shift that a lot of small to medium business clients need to make is that it's not about them it's not about their taste it's not about anybody's taste in fact it's never about taste but it's about their users having said this it's also important to remember that business owners are also users and their employees are also users so you need to really identify first who the product is for, who's going to be using it, interacting with it. And that, that's the clients who visit it and buy or, or consume content or whatever it is that they do. Then there's the owners who, uh, whose business it is, and there's also the employees. So there's, there's a number of sets, sets of people that you need, need to think about. And basically, just keep asking and keep asking why. So whenever a client's, client wants something, I think this is going to help so many people. If you start asking why and you ask and then they give you an answer and then you go, why? It's a little bit the go wide, go deep thing, but it's about every single thing that they ask you for. So if they say, I want a uh, hamburger menu, and you go, okay, why? And they give you a reason why they want the hamburger menu. And then they go, okay, why? Why do you want, why, why that reason? Because they say, you know, why? Uh, because it's cool. It's like, why is it cool? Where have you seen it being cool? Because I've seen it on this website. Oh, okay. And why is that website cool? Oh, because it's, uh, you know, my my brother-in-law and we're in competition. Oh, okay, so why are you in competition? And that always, I'm completely making it up. Sure. But keep asking why until they tell you to literally bugger off. Because it, it always uncovers things, but also it gives you power because it gives you the power of saying, you have not given me a good reason. And I, until you find a good reason why you want something, then you shouldn't be doing it fundamentally, you, you know, unless it's, it's, it helps someone. So, sorry, yeah. No, you'd, uh, you'd mentioned um, it, it doesn't have anything to really do with taste necessarily, which is something that when I was doing branding a lot and I was presenting, uh, you know, however many sketches of the, uh, the possible logo to the, uh, the client, I would always remind them, this is not about your taste. This is about how this is going to resonate with your clients. And, you know, that that helped push those forward a little bit more than if it, they were just choosing, uh, you know, based on their own idea of what the logo should look like. <clears throat> but similarly, 
you had also mentioned that, you know, UX isn't about flashy, you know, hover effects and all of these things because it can get confusing. Um, and merging those two together, I've, uh, I, I have this one site. It's, uh, it's focused at the 65 plus crowd. And it performs incredibly well. However, it's something that I would absolutely not design typically because that's not a demographic that I'm, I'm very, uh, very familiar with as far as designing. And it's gone through many, re uh, like red, uh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, renditions of the, uh, the site. And every time, you know, somebody comes on and they email the, uh, the, the owner saying, Hey, I, I couldn't figure this out or how do you download this or that, you know, whatever question they might have, we go in and fix it. And now a couple of years after it's, it's launched and we've had all of these updates, the, this client gets compliments all the time from the 65 plus crowd saying your site is one of the easiest things I've ever used. It's like everything that I need is right there. It's easy to find. And that's, that's good. UX. Right. Even though it's not your taste, it you is know, you don't have it in your not portfolio my taste. because it's not your taste. Right. I'd love to see it if you can share the link. It sounds, it sounds brilliant. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cause, um, it's, um, it's really interesting. I think we might have had this, this might have come up last time as well, that usually the awards websites with lots of animations and lots of creative things in there are from print designers who haven't really studied how to you know super creative very very talented but mate your site is not usable and it's doing nothing for the users and you're just doing it for yourself to you know to flatter and please yourself so it's a big difference because also it leads straight into accessibility and accessibility is a really big thing it's first of all it's Ill illegal if your website isn't accessible and it does mean that you need to, I say sacrifice, but it's, is it a sacrifice? I am sort of going completely the other way and I'm kind of thinking, is, is it beautiful if it does lots of stuff? Maybe not. Um, it sort of changes the way you design, I think. And then the, the challenge becomes, how can I create something that is to my taste and that I think looks great, but is also accessible and it doesn't have any fancy stuff and especially I get motion sickness really easily. So all the, uh, even GIFs sometimes are like, will you stop that GIF, please? You know, so, because I'm sort of Don't joining. Don't tell Roby that. You're going to get it. I'm joining the Lavender, that. you know, the, the Blue Rinse Brigade. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have something within, within like part of my onboarding process where like in big, bold letters, it says to my client, this is just something where we're communicating internally back and forth. Like this website is not for you you know, and I kind of explained to them, like, this is, these are the things we're going to be looking at for your website, because in the end, do you want something that looks kick ass and oh, this is so neat and I can show my friends? Or do you want something that's going to convert customers? Like, do you want me to put money in your wallet? Or do you want to look cool? Um, and most of the time, they want to put money in their wallet. Yeah. And so as I was saying, absolutely. And as I was saying, you hit the nail on the head, you already are doing it. That is a form of UX. The, the way that you uh, bring it forward, forward with UX is that you really take much longer with the research and you really, and creating the user, user personas is the way to approach that. And uh, when I was at the uh, BFI in London, the British Film Institute, I was working with a web team on a big project and so many user personas were created and, and we worked really a lot on uh, defining that and I think that that's the one thing perhaps that uh, people you know at a smaller level haven't done much of or don't think about doing so much but it's really essential because what it makes you do is it makes you think okay what the, does this specific person let's say her name is is Sharon do when she visits the site because then if you put yourself try and put yourself in her shoes you think well that orange button that I think has such an amazing offer for her, she may be not ready to click it. So if she isn't, what can I give her to do instead? Do you know what I mean? So right. it makes you think in all the sort of alternative and then, okay, if she doesn't click that here, 
what what happens to her now because I still want her to experience the site and make the most out of it and also I want her to go somewhere but because it's also about it's about them but it's also about what you want them to do what your client wants them to do ultimately you just have to lead them by the hand gently so I think that that's a big difference that people are not used to doing so much and maybe for those of us who build funnels maybe maybe you've done a funnel flow perhaps but when you start doing proper user flows that's where it really changes things hugely for me because it means that then the whole plan the whole thing becomes so clear in your head about what needs to happen and what you need to do and it makes doing the wireframes so much easier yeah and and you go through a lot of the research stuff in your course and use some really good examples and i think i'm familiar with sharon i think that's the name you used in there too huh? uh, yeah it is i just I need to figure it. yeah that's this <laughs> so after, after we go that's that's phase one is research where do we go from there so then after the research phase the design phase begins and the design phase this is where it gets interesting because people think that designing is actually drawing things on a page or styling things. No, it's not. The design page is the planning, the uh, design phase rather, is the planning phase still. So it's when you start doing the site map that you will create from all the information that you got in the design phase and the, the wireframes where necessary because we don't always do wireframes let you know let's face it and in, in the real world the process is really really messy because in the in in theory you should carry out the whole of the ux process and then get started on the ui you take all your things you get take all your the, the sitemap the user flows and the wireframes you give them to a ui designer and the ui designer starts working on that the reality of things is very different and because you know design is messy design is is coming, going, to and froing, and that's why I like UX, because it allows for that. It allows for you to change in your mind, changing something, and often finding yourself working on the UI at the same time as the UX, because mm. for budget reasons, or also because it's actually, I think, probably in, in a lot of cases, a better way of working, because unless you have separate design and development teams you know in that case you do need wireframes that they need to be quite accurate and you know if you can do it in in sketch or figma or some uh program that has a code handout uh feature that's great but those are high level budgets because most of us design in browser you know that's the yeah. reality and you talk about having to hand it off from one person to the other or you know it being messy so when we do this when we're working directly with the client how many of you have handed a wireframe to your client? They're going to be pretty confused because they're not familiar with uh, what a wireframe is. They're going to say, oh, this doesn't look good. You know, where's the color? Where's my logo? You know, so kind of at the same time, just because of this is reality and maybe in a perfect world, we would do things a little bit differently, but we also have to mix this in with reality. And in reality, we probably need to have some styling to hand to the customer as part of this process. So I think what you're saying makes complete sense. Absolutely. And there's also, there are specific methodologies that basically work like this. I mean, Agile is is one, but it's not quite the one I'm thinking about right now. The, the one I'm thinking about is called Growth Driven Design, and it's uh, done by HubSpot. They have free courses on it. And in a nutshell, it's basically taking a long time to research, but then deploying an initial version of the product and then building up from that and going and testing it out and going, okay, we need to change this and that and adding, adding things as you go along, which I think is a fantastic way of working. And it's kind of something that I had been doing instinctively mm -hmm. and then realized that there was a methodology that's called like that. And I was looked uh, closer into it and so on. But basically it's so much better because it allows you to go to a client and say, look, this is a big project that you have because actually a lot of small clients actually come to us with really big projects and you're like it's a lot of money but you can tell them that and say look let's spend a considerable chunk of time of time of researching this and that's let's chunk it up so you can pay a monthly fee and or you know we do it in what are called sprints in in agile terminology or scrum which is another um methodology but anyway and then and then uh, they can see results sort of immediately and they it's not a disaster because they haven't 
got a thousand pages website with God knows how many forms and so on. If there are mistakes that can be corrected as you go along, you've only done a little bit. So it doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. And I, when I look back, I think that's really the only way to work, isn't it? Yeah. It, it that, can only be the best way to work. I, I got a good example on doing that the wrong way of a, a website that I have for a client now that has grown huge and now has a ton of visitors and is v extremely vital to his business, but it's just been cobbled together with one patch after another. And now when I look at this and, and, you know, part of it was just, okay, we're back in reality again. When we started the website, they didn't know what they needed. He didn't know. I didn't know, you know, we didn't know who the customers were really going to be. And over time we've learned a lot about that, but man, if I could start that whole thing over now, you know, that $2,000 website I made would be $20,000 for me to redo it today because we would have to do so many things differently now having those years of research, you know, that we've been doing on the fly. Exactly. So instead of, if you, if you know that a project is going to grow, if you look at it as something that you know is going to grow, then you set the foundations in such a way that you sort of build module by module by module. And that's why I like WordPress as a technology because it allows you to do that. I can give you another bad example. I mean, the, the British Film Institute, because it, uh, and when I first saw that website, from behind, which was 11 years ago, they they kept saying, the web team kept saying, you know, the technology we started with, I can't even remember what it was, it's just too hard to change now. We know it's a disaster, but it's too hard to change. Guess what? It's still the same. The core of the BFI website is still the same. And and it's you just look at it and you go, oh, God, I feel for you so much. And But you make it work. You know, you just, you just make it work because you have to make it work. And then... Yeah, somehow, somehow it works. There are buildings. I like the the, I like the, uh, the analogy with with buildings. I think I think it kind of works because there are buildings that are kind of terrible, but but they work and they uh, they serve their purpose. And you know, you know what is fine. Yeah, and I think kind of where the conversation going is leading us perfectly into the third phase, um, which is kind of testing all this, right? So yeah. um, talk to us about that phase of the process. Yes, that again is, I think that is something that a lot of us haven't done before, especially the ones that have come from print. And the testing is because, you know, especially if you, if you have a print mentality or if you have clients that have done the print thing mostly, they think that once you've done something, that's it. It's it's that's it. It's literally almost set in stone, but it's not. That's the beauty of it. So, the the testing happens can only happen after you've gone live. You know, really, you can. You, well, actually, I'm gonna slightly correct that. It can happen with a working prototype that is a basically is it's a website that hasn't been launched yet, and you can do usability testing in a lots of ways before you've launched. You can use your friends, you know, for those who don't have a budget or don't have a big budget, literally use anyone that isn't you, that hasn't worked on the website and ask them if they immediately understand what it's for, if they understand who, what it's trying to get you to do and so on. And actually one really good thing to do for that is either contribute to the design team for WordPress because you will go through those scenarios and also uh, sign up to do usability, to be a tester for one of the big usability testing websites. It's really interesting what they get you to do and actually very, very simple. But anyway, there are a lot of sites that are actually affordable for most of most, cli most clients. And uh, because you can pay by trial, you know, there's various ways that you can do it and you get real human beings using your website. So this you can do for some testing before you launch, but the real data will only come after you have launched and people, the real people who are interested in your, in your products or whatever it is that you're offering via the website will let you know whether they like it or not or how they interact with it and so on. So that's why the going back is, is inevitable and that's what makes the process great in a way and then also another thing that I want to say and that's something that I don't always do in my own projects 
or that clients find difficult to understand that they need to invest money in. And that is the overall style guidelines for the website. And they're actually not just style, the content blocks, the things that will be repeated, the branding, obviously, but all those things that are repeatable, all, the, all those things that you set can systemize should be systemized. That's the best investment that anyone can do. With my Design for Geeks website, I am finding myself now constantly every day in the situation where I'm going, damn, I haven't quite systemized this. Mm -hmm. And I still, I still just cobble it along as I go along. And I think, okay, I'm going to take a, a time out to systemize this because then when I have to hand it out to someone else, they can do it. But also what happens if you have a system, if there's elements in the system that you need to change because you've realized that actually the buttons should not be green, that actually inexplicably call to action buttons work in a stop color, which is red, which I never would have thought so, but apparently that's what happens. So if all the buttons need to change, then it's much easier to do it if you've systemized it, if you have global settings or if you have a library of things. So sure. it's never too early to get started on that. It's such an investment. And I find it difficult to, small clients don't, it's a bit harder to, well, actually, why do I say small clients? Any clients, it's, it's not as easy as it may seem to persuade them that that's the best investment they could make. Yeah. And you know, I think, and you ought to forgive me if I'm remembering this wrong, but when you first launched your course, I signed up for it that I think the day you launched it and watched, watched it all within 48 hours. Uh, yeah. But you kind of have this process on like a linear timeline, right? Uh, so there's step phase one, phase two, phase three, and then there's some arrows that could take you back to one or the other, right? And I almost kind of picture it as a complete circle in my mind, because if you're starting with research and then you're designing and then you're testing, well, after that, when you test it and you get some data back, you got to start at the circle again. And it, I mean, it's it's almost a never ending thing because you can always improve upon these designs, you know, or, or, or your projects. Absolutely. Because also, who's to say that the users will stay the same? Yeah, they may not stay the same or the environment doesn't stay the same, you know, or maybe sometimes something that works in the, in the summer won't work in the winter. It could be that because people habits change or the demographics change or there's so many things that, or for something that's geographically, uh, you know, that's geolocated, it could be that the population changes over the summer. There are so many things that, so many variables to bear in mind that you just have to keep testing. And some things maybe work at some point, but then they stop working for, you know, it is, I, I do think that that's uh, what it is, is it's never stopping, which is also why, it's an important part of the way we educate our clients to make them understand that really a website is an investment. It's an ongoing investment. It's like, uh, you know, can I compare it to food? No, but it's like or having a, a garden, a car. But the thing is, a car gives no real, is useful, but it gives you no real return. Yeah, if you have I mean, a garden, it's, it's almost like if they're a brick and mortar business, you don't, uh, you know, you don't rent your building one month and then never rent it again. I mean, you have to continue to rent that building to continue to get use out of it and continue to have people coming in it and maintain the building and all that. It's the same thing with your website. Absolutely. And, or, uh, I like the plants thing because plants actually, you know, if you, if you're, um, if you grow vegetables or fruit, that's it's a return. But you need to you can't just, you know, put them in the ground and that's it. You need to they might they might get ill, they might get parasites that you hadn't had before. You need to you keep to, you know, try or maybe you try you know, the second year it doesn't yield in the same way. So you need to change the position. It's it's the same thing. So that's I think what uh I'm sure I'm not the only one in saying that it has sometimes been hard to make clients understand that spending money on the website regularly is a huge investment. This is a completely uh, off, off the subject, not off the subject, but not in the context of this conversation, but we really need to make a video like this explaining these things. It's very client focused because I think yeah. your, your course does a great job of explaining this to designers and developers. And I want to give you some time to talk about how people can go sign up for that. But I wonder if there's something we couldn't figure out that's brief and we could get clients to watch that help them understand this process. 
Yeah, I think we should all get together and do that because we, I'm sure all of us really do as much as we can. And I think that things are improving. A lot of clients are seeing that now and it's much easier for them because there are so many people that are successful on the web that uh, clearly spend, you know, invest in, in that. Uh, but yes, I think we should do it. Definitely. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I know we mentioned the course about 7,000 times, but let's, uh, let's talk about how people can go sign up, kind of what to expect from the course. How long is it? Uh, how long will it take them to get through of it? Uh, what kind of things do, can they expect to get out of it when they've completed it? So correct me if I'm wrong, because you've taken it. But mm -hmm. I think that once you finish this course, you really do have a framework. It's only a free course. So obviously, it doesn't go too much in depth. But I think that you get tangible results. And I am very grateful to say that I am getting really good feedback from it from people that actually reach out to me precisely to say that, to say, I had a problem with a client website last night and I went through your course at, you know, 1.5 speed. And by the end of it, I completely solved my, my solution. I went to bed having sorted it out and that really changed my life. Thank you so much. And so I'm not saying that your life will be changed, but I'm saying that you will have a framework. It's only a free course, but it will give you a solid process to follow. And it give you, gives you a lot to build up on. Obviously, a, a, a lot. there's a lot more that you will realize that you probably have to learn, but it will be enough for you to get started looking at things from a UX perspective that maybe you didn't have before, and especially a user-centered design perspective. Oh. I'll say from my, would you agree or? Yeah, yeah. From my perspective, I mean, I definitely walked away with things. And, you know, when, when I was going to plan this show with you, I didn't have to go look up notes on what to talk about because I've been through this and I knew all the phases already. And I, I had a good idea of how to structure all this because I did walk away with a lot of that knowledge. What, what I think the, the biggest thing for me in it, and, and I think everybody will get this out of it no matter what, is, this awareness. So just realizing, um, like you said, we're kind of all doing some of these things in different ways, but it gives you this awareness of giving purpose to thinking about user-centered design, and it makes you aware of everything in your surroundings. And I think that's why I love those posts in your Facebook group so much when people are, you know, uh, sharing things that don't even have to do with websites because it does. It makes you aware of all kinds of things in your life or surrounding you where they did not think about you when they designed this. And, you know, we talked about this in the episode we did with you before that, and you mentioned it here, design isn't styling something, it's planning something. And there's so many things around us that, that somebody has set uh, and made big money to design and they never thought of these really simple things that would have really helped the user experience. So I think the biggest takeaway I got from it was just like kind of this awakening of awareness to actually purposefully think about these things before I start designing. Yeah, it's uh, a huge shift. And I have to say, out of the really, really lovely feedback that I got, the, the one that I that cha made my day yesterday was from this print designer who's just recently started designing for the web. And he said to me, this completely made me understand exactly what the difference is and how much I wasn't prepared for what the shift is. And that's, you know, it's the main, that's the main shift. That is the main shift. And I was so pleased that he would say that that's what was clear to him because that was precisely my intention. So I felt, I thought that that was great. So I think that that's what you're going to get out of it. That's that's my definitely my intention. That's exactly what you said, Carl. So thanks. Yeah. And, you know, I think Matt's had the same comments before, like moving from print to web, even though we still both do a little bit of print. But, you know, the thing that I think Matt said that he's really liked so much about web is this ability to go in and change things after the fact. Yes. Right? You yeah, don't have 10,000 copies. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. great. Although I have to say that recently I looked back at my book designing days thinking, oh my God, it was so easy. Please give me a book to design. It was so easy. I actually did write back to a friend 
uh, who's in, still doing that and saying, please, can you give me a book project? I love it. It's just so simple. Just imagine uh, if you were an o- Adobe Illustrator and every time you turned around, the artboard was changing sizes and proportion. <laughs> like you'd go insane. Yeah. And I think that was the imagine, biggest like shift. I know, and you had to think to design for 10 different types of book and it's the same book you get paid the same but you have to design 10 different ones right. and some of them are also bigger type because it oh my god yes so but i know I, I wouldn't change for the world i think it's so endlessly endlessly fascinating and because my other all uh, the reason why i'm doing all this is that i can't wait to get to the ui and i can't wait to get to the psychology of vision because that's something else that i'm but i thought i cannot jump into that even though that is actually much more my area if you want because i am also i'm desperately visual i'm also a photographer you know and really um and psychology of vision fascinates me and it's i have done a a talk on that this year but before i get to that it does need to get through ux that is at the basis you cannot do my i'd be delighted if everybody who watches that course now thinks yeah it always has to start from ux even if you just do a really as short a version as you want of the process, do make it start from UX. It's, you know, you can do it. You can literally do it in two hours with a client if you want. Just reduce it to the, to the minimum, n- n- indispensable. But whatever you do, it has to go from that. And then once I feel like I've, you know, said it's never going to be enough, but, you know, enough about it, then I can't wait to move to the really juicy stuff like typography and color and all the things that I love. No doubt. Well, where can I, I'll I'll make sure to put links in the show notes, but where can everybody go to sign up for your course now? Well, the, uh, go to designforgeeks.com. There's a big, uh, inviting button on the homepage that everybody seems to click on. Nothing to change that. And it will take you to the uh, sign up page. Um, and please, if you're not in the group already, join the group because it's really good fun. And we talk about this kind of thing all day long and we have also days where we do reviews and yeah all sorts of uh, nice things happening in there so did I say designforgeeks.com it's easy isn't it that's easy yeah. Awesome. Matt, do you got anything to add before we wrap this up? No, I don't think so. Um, possibly all right, I'll go back when I said car, I meant taxi. There you go. There's one that, that okay. that's both 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 parts. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. That's a good idea, actually. Yes, absolutely. But uh, other than that, no, I'm all set. Just correcting the record for yourself. Yes, please. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, Pisha, we certainly uh, appreciate you coming on the show again and being a part of our community. I know everybody gets a ton of value from all the wisdom you share with us. So thank you very much for that. And we appreciate all the time that you you share with us. So as a reminder, if this group helps you in any way, the easiest way to help us is to share the content, subscribe to our channel and use our affiliate links. It's all free. It takes little time and it greatly helps support the show. That is all for now. We will catch you all inside the group. Bye-bye.